Thank you so much, Leopoldo. It's been a while. And of course, I wanted to meet you geographically, but let's do it virtually. I hope, uh, can you hear me? Is my mic okay? I can hear you just fine. Can you hear me? Great. Anyway, thank you again for inviting me. I'm, I am excited. I'm just across the river from the state of Washington. So I'm your Northern Oregon uh, listening post and watchtower and all of that. I can see Washington from our upstairs bedroom <laughs> across the river. So I, I feel close. So I have a selection of poems. I, I decided to be serious tonight. I've got some serious things to get off my chest and to read, some of which are in my book, uh, Available Light, my prideful goldfish publication from 2016 with the help of Kun Woon, and as you all know. And also I'll tell you some of the ones that have never been read, never been published and so on. I wanna start with one that's never been read, never published. And some of you know I'm a musician, so I'm gonna call this a world premiere. <laughs> it's called Before Books. Long before fugitive words were labeled poetry, ciphered on bark, paper, stone, acts of rhyme, of celebration, acts of grief and consolation, foreheads bowing to foreheads, the recitations of fluttering shapes in the sky, singing us into reverie. Before literacy, rain drenched us with fierce scansion, thunder drew applause, eyes read not left nor right, eyes held in the grip of another's eyes, a bent figure in the distance followed the line of a ridge, walking, carrying his short story on his back. Long before words were hunted down like escaped slaves to be found guilty and hanged from the scaffold of literacy, we found our own way of rhyme in lying down on a bed of sonnets to wake in iambic resonance. Second one is, and, and also in, in terms of my, one could call musicality, we talk about making a varied program. You read something serious and then you better read something light and everybody can take a breath and so on. So this is a soliloquy um, for a failed Shakespearean type of um, poet, uh, you might say playwright. playwright who writes this, uh, and for me, it was fun to actually write a rhyming couplet at the end of a poem. Because many times, I, and many of us, you know, in the 21st century, uh, ignore rhyme. This is called containment. Were I tasked the box to think inside, what box, say I, no shape there is within my mind but tetrahedra, snowflake and fainting star, these shapes which are of, off, of open thought and pattern of heart, the agony of experience sung in art, like beating wings in autumnal sky, the daily challenged balance of souls, you and I, win nor lose, be not a sum of goals, writ into love's imperfect roles. My little guy. So now from the book, I brought you ocean scenery. I brought you ocean scenery at bedtime when you felt too inland. Soft waves broke upon my hand. I spirited excursions with a pie plate bottom tin can man whom we loved invited up and gave a little windy fan. Hungry bugs came barging out the cracks. I told you lacy quiet facts, never the whole nor hard, but the gentle choices of a bard. 
And with the special one that lifted your chagrin, you let me in, you let me in. You notice I, I memorized the last two lines. I, I didn't have to read those. <laughs> so uh, let's go to another one from the book, Birth of a Muse. This is admittedly, this is kind of obscure mysticism, but I permit myself once in a while, a little dash of obscure mysticism. Birth of a Muse. Into the cold, cold marble canyons of the night speaks the child his pain. Echoless like an unhatched bird, innocent of the power that men know, hammered into the shields that muffle their cries. And at field's edge in the tower where wisdom waits, fading tapestries of history slowly change shape. So now as we remember the, the programming rhythm we, we develop of relieving the serious with, with the gay and the mirthful, so to speak. So this is called Song of the Drifter. And I use song advisedly. I am a musician and I write songs. So this is the other meaning of song. That, that appears in poetry, and I don't think it's ever going to be set as, a, as an actual song. And you'll find out why in a minute. Song of the Drifter. On your door would I knock, but you live in a tent. How will you know I was heaven sent? In your ear would I sing, but you dream of sky filled with birds who sing better than I. In your fire would I cook ambrosial fare, golden lentil, tart of pear. For your brow would I spin erudite rhyme, transporting you back to Shelley's time. But all I do bring are minimal things, no songs, no verse, no flowers, no rings. All I can feel, all I can say, is might our hearts draw close today? So uh, joining us this evening is hopefully my sister, I think my sister's joining from California on the, uh, this, we are hours away from her birthday. And I do not send birthday cards with rhymes, <laughs> but I do write poems that hopefully Hallmark will never be interested in. So uh, this is a poem for my, for my sister Anne's birthday, uh, a world premiere, as they say in music, and she's a fine pianist. So uh, that's, I, so I, I did spoil, this is an alert. This is not a spoiler alert. This is the spoiler, I told you. I gave away the plot of this poem, but that, hopefully that's okay. The title is The Language of the Hands, subheading to a pianist, sub subheading, you know who you are. Embedded in the word heart are the spellings ear, hear, and art, each a musical part of Amadeus Mozart, whose perfect thumb and pulsing hand hidden in arpeggio from forte to pianissimo, spirals toward the light. But now the darker Brahms emerges from the depths, neither heals nor harms, yet completely charms. We want to play them all, monarchs of the concert hall, minor, major, orchestrators, loves, great negotiators. Thus the pianist's craft sometimes cries, often laughs transporting us within our dreams to lands of magical extremes. Recited in our hearts, this language of all lands, the pianists urge to speak in poetry of hands. Embedded in the word heart 
sonorities of ear, hear, and art, each a living part of Amadeus Mozart. Happy birthday. And And the show must go on. <laughs> so the next one has kind of a paradoxical title. It seems like it would be light, but it's not. It's called Punctuation. In the Old West, we punctuated our sentences with bullets, leaving a brief pause for desperate pleading. Wars grew out of well-crafted rhetoric, the generals punctuating their orders with bombs and invasions. The president stood before us with a worried expression, promising not to punctuate history with mass murder and occupations. Our children paraded to school in rank and file, prepared to learn proper punctuation, spelling, syntax. The manipulation of verbs and nouns Debate in preparation for condemnation ending at times in massacre. We taught them the history of slavery with the lives of runaways sometimes punctuated by lynching. Gentlemen, I give you the semicolon. Do what you will with it. I don't want a history of bullet points, not for me, my family, unknown mothers, children with their run on sentences. Period. <laughs> <laughs> oh, who's, thank you for that audience. That means I kind of make it as a bit of a stand up comedian. That's, <laughs> as you know, that's every poet's secret wish is to be, is to succeed, not to fail as a stand up comedian, but actually succeed. And uh, that's my secret. I'm revealing it to you tonight. <laughs> but, oh my gosh, that would be so fun for me if I could do that. But I'm too serious, right? And the next poem, maybe there is a joke in there. This is called Astronomy. As you know, astronomy to the Greeks, that was in the quadrivium. It was one of the sacred categories of science, music being one. So I always mention it quadrivium, and of course, math and geometry. So this is called astronomy. You asked for a chocolate truffle right after refusing my offer of the sun, moon, and stars. You responded to my lust with the names of every bird fidgeting through the plum tree outside our window. Astronomy has always worked for you. With precision, you practice the gravitational pull, the invisible force that holds fast comets to their eccentric orbits, especially the ones that come our way once in a lifetime. And when no one laughs or applauds, it's like I'm giving the Gettysburg Address, right? <laughs> And no one applauded. Anyway. Well, we're all muted. And here's the thing is <laughs> here's the thing is you're getting a lot of silent, you know, uh, you know, applause and reaction. And as I've said before, it, it changes for you depending on what computer you're on. But if you're muted, and in my case, if I hold down the key on my keyboard the space bar, I'm temporarily unmuted. And then all I have to do is take the, the off and I'll go back to mute. So, you know, I do encourage anybody who can find the technical means to do this. At the end of the poem is to, you know, um, do anything you want to do, make all the noise you want to make. And that's a, a nice, easy way to do it. And then still be able to go quickly back to mute as I go back now. So, Joel, this is your sister here. And there are six of us watching you. We're laughing and applauding, just so you know, but we're gonna mute back out, okay? Love you, baby. <laughs> Two thumbs up, dear. And now, just for a, a treat, you get to hear Doomsday Clock, guys. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> this is the low point of the evening. 
You ask me the time of day. I just lost track. I ain't looking forward. I ain't looking back. I just sit here like a fool in shock at two midnight, at two minutes to the midnight on the doomsday clock. I'm going to start that again. You ask me the time of day. I just lost track. I ain't looking forward. I ain't looking back. I just sit here like a fool in shock at two minutes to midnight on the doomsday clock. Fear kept us building the mother of bombs. Dad went into a panic. Priests quote the Psalms. Our children's futures are running amok. It's two minutes to midnight on the doomsday clock. Two minutes to midnight, two minutes to care, two minutes to love everyone, everywhere. Now we better hold hands while we still have a chance. With our loved ones close, we'll do our dance. At two minutes to doom, opportunity knocks. Two minutes to midnight on the doomsday clock. Two minutes to midnight, two minutes to care. Two minutes to love everyone, everywhere. Uh, Leopoldo, do I have time for to sneak one, to sneak two? Abs absolutely. Ah, so let's let's share found object. Never been read, never been published, and hopefully we're we're launching it tonight. The path meandered from rock to tree to rock, tunnel to single wild lily in the morning misted forest. No footfall heard, nor in loam impressed, just me and something else preceding me in ricochet branch to branch. So for a protrusion of roots across my path, like some great partially interred hand to appear, holding fast the forest floor as in desperate grip, a found object representing the whole of all life, upon its solid star, performing for me all that my own hand relinquished quest after quest, failed test after test. My hand never clutched as this, never reached as this, another's to conjoin. The one, one dare not clasp, the one, one need not fear, but leave where found like an object at the root of life's sufficiency. So maybe one more for the for, from the book. Would that be? Thank you, thank you. You might have noticed I have ironic or contradictory titles that may not give you a clue of of, of what it's all about. This one's called ambition. Make sure everything you create is worthless. It wasn't bought, cannot be sold, or must I sell these words like a beloved daughter or a slave who rises with the same sun that enfolds morning glories? Make sure everything you say is meaningless. It is meaning that creates the enemy, meaning that demands apologies before our execution. Make sure every tune you sing has no end nor beginning, for all creation begins with a conjunction and a tapered decrescendo that conjoins it to the voice of eternal silence. Make sure love is rarely stated. Be in the state of love without declaration. Hold hands with the horizon, though it lie beyond reach, leaving all keys in their locks until both sides of the door achieve equality. Dance with the dawn when invited, making sure your shoes were left in a dark closet alongside your identity. One more short one and we're, we're good. Would that be okay? Okay, this is this is my uh, encore to use a musical term, my self-given encore. It's called anarchy. 
there are wildflowers and flowers that long to be wild. Brilliant bouquets passed up for a gnarled stick of wormwood inhabited by lichens. Anarchy in hand, I approach your door, having sensed your distaste for arrangements. Knock, knock. <laughs> That's it. And you notice I end, end my stand-up comedy with a knock-knock joke. You, you, you get that, right? <laughs> I always end my readings with, with a joke. Thank you so much. There we go. So uh, thank you, uh, Leopoldo. And it was nice to hear you, Joel. And since you ended, you didn't really end with a knock-knock joke. You ended with knock-knock. So I feel like some I should continue it by telling a knock-knock joke. And this is a joke. Uh, I was one of three contestants in a, uh, in a date match or whatever in Ann Arbor. They had a dating game show. And I was one of three women that they selected for this guy. And one of his first questions was, uh, what do you, how important is a sense of humor? And so young woman one said, oh, I think humor is very important. And my friends all say I have the best sense of humor in the world. And I, I just, uh, I'm a, just a constant source of laughs. And then he asked the second one, uh, what do you think about sense of humor? And she said, well, I couldn't agree more. I mean, humor for me is a staple of life and it's the most important thing. And he said to me, what about you? And I said, knock, knock. Everybody laughed right away. And then he said, who's there? And I said, interrupting cow. And he said, interrupting cow, I said, moo. And the audience chose me to be the date on the strength of that knock-knock joke. So knock-knock jokes are very important. Anyway, I want to read from, I'm not going to read anything unpublished. Joel's a very brave person. I'm going to read from my last book. But before that, I wanted to read from my new and selected poems. Uh, I just was kind of reviewing it. Uh, and I want to read a couple of poems that I normally don't read. And this one is called South from My Mouth. I asked him, I said, Timothy, this sea, is it of water or of sand? And he, does it feel wet or dry? And I to him, but Tim, you know I cannot feel for real what is outside of me. I cannot grasp the catching stick, the rasp of dry, the slick unlatching slide of wet. I only get the feeling it's a sea. He turned back to his carving. Again, I had to ask, but Tim, what's that supposed to be? It's for the sea of sand and or of water, maybe an oar to part the waves, maybe a shovel to dig our graves. To, to row, to bury, to ride, to hide, you let me know when you decide. Sun rained on us, I sought a tree to turn on me, upset the scenery. Night came, the blade was done. Tim laid it out across his knees. His hands were one with wood. I don't know how I knew. There wasn't a moon. I couldn't see. Throughout the night, I thought until bright day, and to my thinking, darkness was a mouth. A name by any other rose, it said. Six words I heard like birds, all flying south. I like it sometimes when I read older poems and I don't really remember writing them, so I don't really know what they mean more than anybody else, uh, sometimes less. Um, this is, um, this is a, a Thassos Kouros, and I'll read the poem and then read the epigraph. This is uh, from the island of Thassos, the northernmost of the Greek islands. And there's a Kouros there as a messenger, so a huge statue. Nearly a whole year's work wasted. The treachery of men or the gods was one thing, something I almost counted on. But this, this sudden infidelity of stone, all those summer months, its marble length yielded to my hand in ways no boy, no woman ever could. And now even the creature pacifist spawn could not have flaunted a more awful face the blind soft look as of someone drowned. My intended messenger of peace and light will lie in darkness, bonded to the God of war. Even the strongest slaves are sweating as they lower it so much ballast for the half-built outer wall. 
whose double sureness mocks my own incertitude. Quickly I turn away, witness to the burial of some stranger's child. And the story of this Thassos Kuros was, this was a great uh, statue carved by a wonderful archaic sculptor who worked from the feet up. So he worked the whole statue until he got to the face. And then there was discovered a flaw in the marble where the left eye should be. And so the, to the Greeks then the whole statue was ruined. You couldn't have Hermes with a bad eye. So they chucked it in between the two walls of the ancient city. And it's the only piece of archaic Thassian sculpture to survive. It's this huge monumental thing. And I thought it was wonderful how this sculptor was in, must have been in despair to have his almost finished sculpture thrown away. But then it was the only one that survived. So he has a, a fame that he didn't know about. Okay, one more from this early book. This was my husband's favorite uh, poem. Um, and it's built on a true story that um, Schubert was a very, very popular composer. Joel talked a lot about music. So um, Franz Schubert had a lot of guests and people always wanted to meet him and to talk to him. And he would always ask, can er was? Literally, can he what? <laughs> Meaning, what, what can you do? What can he do? What can this person do that I should meet him? So this is a blackbird talks to the music student. It's all a quote. I used to sing at Schubert's parties from the tops of chinaberry trees. He'd hook the prettiest guest on his arm, invite her for an evening stroll. That was my cue. Of course, with the men, it was different. Conner Voss, the master would mutter half to himself. Oh, thank you. May I inquire whether you sing? Really? And is it common for you humans to like singing without liking to sing? Curious. No, I'm not so romantic as an emperor or an oriole. It's just that where I come from, we're all poets. Oh, it's not your fault. I'm only disappointed in myself. You'd think I'd have learned from singing, never not to sing. And there was um, one of the few cases where an editor, uh, before it got published, the editor wanted me to change it to, oh, you think I'd have learned from singing, never to stop singing. And I said, no, never not to sing. That's what we want. Anyway. So then this latest book, the artwork on the backs of gargoyles, and it has a picture on the, let's see if I can, <laughs> there we go. It was a, a picture from my friend, Walt Halpern, uh, and there are pictures throughout of gargoyles. Uh, and I'd like to read, uh, it's all Sestinas and Villanelles with two paradels thrown in for good measure. And this is one I haven't read before. Uh, it's, it's historically accurate. And it's uh, called The Wild Boy of Aviron. If you know the story in France, well, the poem tells the story anyway. January 1800, a naked boy crept out of the French woods, scooped fresh water from a ditch, dug potatoes, then made quick work of eating. He paid no heed, heed as they closed in, but at the first touch fought being taken with the soundless whirling fury of a dream. Those who caught him were untouched by any dream of knowledge. It was just wrong for a naked boy to run wild. Their town had always taken morals to heart. They gave him clothes, food, water, spoke of release but progress closed in on him. Historical forces were at work. A scientist named Itard began to work with the boy, a brilliant man fueled by a dream of freeing the humanity enclosed in that bestial husk, revealing the naked mind. The boy seemed to want only food, water, sleep. He might learn to speak if these were taken from him. 
Itar didn't know what he'd taken upon himself. After years of hard work, the boy was toilet trained, wore clothes, drank water from a cup. But the original dream to make a civilized man from a naked boy was abandoned. Time and silence closed in. The boy was better about being closed in. He dressed himself, kept clean, liked being taken in hand by women. Still, he slept naked and touched girls who came to help with the work in ways that violated their common dream of love. He ate like a beast, but drank water like a saint. He could knife through the dark water of mountain lakes from dawn until night closed in. They gave him, still mute, to a woman whose dream was to have a son. After he'd been taken, Itard said he'd first known the boy was his life's work when he saw him sleeping, dreamless and naked. No kisses work. The prince stays closed in ice, still in wild dreams of bright water. A naked boy leaps free, laughs, and will not be overtaken. Uh, then this is a very few of my poems are autobiographical, and this is typical in that respect that it's not autobiographical. Uh, but this it's funny what, what poems people think are autobiographical. Usually if they talk about childhood and they're negative, they're sure that it's a <laughs> negative childhood. This is one people are always ascribing to me. But uh, I, did, I did jump rope. That's the autobiographical detail. And I did have a sister. That's about as far as it goes. This is called The Easy Miracle. You're skipping rope again. Everyone you know, four, five, is alive. Your Easter sister's home, 99, in time to see a miracle, 100. But after that, the easy numbers return. Your mother saves you knocking on the window. Dinner, you take the steps Noah style, the kitchen spotless. Your mom steps forward gingerly to inspect you. You know I don't allow dirt inside, she says, knocking her spoon against the sink. This is a home, not a stable. Wash up, I've saved the easy chores for you. Dinner is not the miracle it once was. Your sister says the miracle of Easter is hogwash. Dad tells mom strong steps should be taken. He calls your sister easy. Your sister chokes. Your mom says, both of you know I don't allow fights. Not here, not at home. Your sister, well, mom, at least I'm not knocking the food. Later, you go in without knocking. Your sister frowns. Don't wait for a miracle sport, she says. Miracles aren't allowed at home. You'll have to get out, follow in my footsteps. Life isn't just skipping a hundred, you know. There are so many deaths, none of them easy. Her eyes and flashing words make you uneasy. You go to bed, start to sleep. There's a knocking. Your father comes in, sits on the bed. You know we love each other, he says. That's a miracle. But sometimes your big sister oversteps herself. He leans over, presses a kiss home. Lightning years. You tear yourself away from home like tissue. Success doesn't come easy, but it comes. You leave a loopy chain of steps in someone's snow ragged as your heart's knocking. Every breath you manage is a miracle. You survive, but what exactly do you know? You know you'll go back. You'll stand on the steps knocking, hoping against hope for the easy miracle. Please God, let no one be home. I'm glad my childhood wasn't quite like that. <laughs> Um, so here's a, a villanelle, uh, and the, one of the things I did in this book, I have different forms of Sestina, different forms of villanelle. Um, I did a lot of playing with the forms over the years, and uh, but this one is a fairly standard one, and uh, it's called To Her Husband, To Her Lover. 
Some story wife crystallizes in salt when she looks back. I count knots in boards or crumbs when you touch me sometimes. It's not my fault lightning strikes one like a clock in the hall. Thought kids play musical chairs. Your wife becomes some story wife, crystallizes in salt, dissolves. If I drink from your cup, it will fall, break on honeycombed tile. An inside girl hums when you touch me sometimes. It's not my fault I get thrown. Clay bowl, horseless rider, strike ball rolling uphill. When cornered Jack is all thumbs, some story wife crystallizes in salt, licks him like a stamp. The icebox opens. All edibles dance, disingenuous as plums when you touch me sometimes. It's not my fault I shed husbands like needles. Each new snow numbs April's green brink and your eyes scare me like drums. Some story wife crystallizes in salt when you touch me. Sometimes it's not my fault. All right. Um, a couple more. Uh, this poem. Uh, well, this one is uh, semi autobiographical. I seem to be stick closer to the truth when it's about people in my life as opposed to me myself. Uh, this is called Ned's Art. Beginnings, yes, but who knows how things will end. As a feverish child singing in my everyday sick bed, I didn't. Neither did my seamstress mother, forced to bend every night over her own lap, biting off thread as she sewed. She said, the truth isn't in wine or song. If you want the truth, you have to divine it like underground water with a stick not try to define it as yours, but the one truth worth knowing we learn at the end. My Sunday school teachers didn't confine themselves to the truth. Sing at the table, sing in bed, they told me. The devil will get you when you're dead. They really thought, I thought as well, God would send singers of love songs to hell. But my path there took a sudden bend in high school when my art teacher praised the romantic divine Fragonard. She said classicism was hanging by a thread. His swinging girl, her half off shoe marked its end. I hung a poster of that girl above my bed. I could almost hear her singing. Some nights I dream her fine blue day, her lover, her afterworld were mine. I'd swing into heaven on a song but that dream would end in daylight guilt, my covers at the foot of my bed. Mom said, you need dates, Lynn, a cocktail party line. Her words wandered. When she finally found the deep end of her life, her mind bent over and bit off the thread of her thought. Ned, my college voice coach said, you're hopeless. I love you. Ned drank too much wine. He wove my name into an aria. He became my friend, my confidant, my lover. The school year came to an end and Ned had no job. He got drunk and enlisted one fine May day. Nine months later, his last letter home said, music obscures the truth. When I'm lying in bed some nights, the aria Ned rewrote for me starts to thread its way through the dark of my mind like a musical vine. The ticking clock is a metronome then, not a mine. I hear his love song coming from beyond the bed, bend. Credi me lend and cred me amen. A sword hangs by a thread above the bed I call mine. 
I hope our spirits will blend into mercy like music at the end. It's a hope I savor like wine. Okay, I'll read one more. And um, it's one I like to read because uh, it is autobiographical and um, it's, a, it's a paradel. And I think most people know now, but a paradel was a form invented by Billy Collins. Uh, he claimed to have found this form in the old troubadours lyrics and he presented it as this very, very difficult, impossible form. And it is, it's the most difficult form. And then he wrote a few examples that ended absurdly with the, the, uh, 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 you have to have exactly the same number of words repeated um, in a certain order. And it has to be only those words, no more, no fewer. And it is almost impossible to write, but with the computer, you can do it. <laughs> and uh, so he, he invented this form, I think, to prove how ridiculous formal poetry is. But I think the successful versions of a paradel show that very formal poetry can be very powerful poetry, at least I think so. So anyway, this is called Paradel on Love. Once our hearts were open, we made love. We made love once our hearts were open. We turned and embraced in huge unmade spaces ruined by war. Unmade, we turned and embraced in huge spaces ruined by war. Once we turned and embraced open war in huge spaces we made, our hearts were ruined by unmade love. Have you vanished? You have vanished from the face of this life. Still, I miss belonging to you and longing to have love. Still, I miss belonging to you to have love and longing. I have vanished from this life to miss longing. And still, you have the face of love belonging to you. Our old blind pain did not help us find a way to God. Our old pain did not help us find a way to blind God. God could not let us be true to one another. One God could not let us be true to another. Let us find another blind God to be true to. Our old one-way pain God did not, could not help us. Our old way of belonging to blind war turned our heart spaces to pain. We once embraced love and could have vanished from another God to find the one true face to help us. You were not open, God. You did not let be and have ruined us. And still, in this unmade life, made huge by longing, I miss love. Thank you. Thank you, Leopoldo. So here it goes. <clears throat> This is again in uh, uh, continuation of the theme in my last uh, few presentations to this group. The poem is called Convalescence and uh, it's exactly what it means. On the seventh day in H2 ward, crossed into G3, knees and hands. Though she is lost to me, memories rem remain cherished. To have a bed, shower at will, or simple pleasures shared with birds. A preparation for the ordeal of the exit interview next day. Waited outside the conference room, assailed by nervous apprehension, one thought uppermost in mind, will I be let out today? Ushered into the conference room, seated beside son and daughter-in-law, 
attorneys dressed in their work uniforms, I waited silent, seeming submissive. Facing us were Dr. Kim, senior psychiatrist, a psychiatry resident and a social worker. Dr. Kim released me into the care of my son and daughter-in-law. Subject to follow on outpatient treatment at El Camino Hospital. Visits to psychiatrists and psychologists till death does us part. On reflection, the joy of surviving a difficult time is savored. This understanding brings one closer to all one's mentally ill brethren. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. This is my second time here. So my first poem here, I'm gonna read from my book called The Theater. I published it about two years ago. It's called To a Silence. To a Silence. Grace Ghost Talk without a voice, in a body, in a motion, a past touch and empty comfort. Look into the mirror, full of faces, staring, staring over and over again. Can't see oneself. Let it go, didn't mean it to be. Turn away in a body, in emotion. Forgive the silence. Find one's reflection in the mirror. You're only human. Do I have time to read a couple of short, short ones? Sure. Okay, these are all, uh, like I did last time there. These are Michael poems. They're very, very short. So this one is called Sad. This is out of my book, Flying Kites in the Moonlight. I have a whole section of these Michael poems. No, two, three, four lines, and that's it. So this one is called said. Words just said. Eyes can't hide what was indeed said. I'll read my one other one here. It's called war. A bullet ricochets. A child ducks. Okay, thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you all. Um, as I mentioned earlier, when I was talking to you, I'm from Denver, um, but I'm actually planning to uh, visit uh, the Seattle area sometime this spring. I published a novel called The Perfect Stranger, and uh, I published it during the pandemic, so I haven't been able to get out. Um, but uh, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm planning to uh, spend a part of April in the Seattle area and so on. And so I'm uh, checking out various uh, open mic venues to let people know I'm headed their way. Um, I mentioned also I'm a performance poet down here in uh, Denver. More, most often than not, I perform poetry to music. Um, in fact, I have a venue, I've been doing it for 21 years now, where um, we invite poets to get up and uh, we jam with them. Um, just going to read one poem. Uh, actually, it's going to be half of a poem. And it's called um, Amazon Between Your Diamond Divine. We speak in tongues, you and I. Tongues intertwine through the slime of so many lifetimes. From the slippery of the snake, through Noah's doubt-drenched tide, you have slithered, I have slathered, you have bent like a bare-bowed tree, and I have bowed to the rhythm of your rhyme. Through suicide on the galley, the pin, the pine, the pain of plantations, crime, I have scorched my knees, then stretched my lizard in the hot of your palm, soaked in our sweat, trembling straining to penetrate the Amazon between your divine, between the ooh and the ah, between the oh yes and the oh my God. Once on the bandied banks of the Nile, beguiled, these young tongues writhed, our toes tickled in gurgling slime. Clucking our tongues at the lazy wink of the sated crocodile, I roared with the cheetah, you howled of mad ape in heat, pressed 
my Prometheus between your pyramid as the stone startled silent sphinx cocked its stoic brow. My tall and dense, wrapped in your thicket, we wrestled like spiders, mommy and daddy long legs lashing in the mossy jade, the hot muddy cool, the misty dappled shade, thrashing our symphony among the quivering green, dashing the doubt you harbored even then that I might quit this tongue's resolve to crawl forever your Kilimanjaro to climb even through time to that wet emerald Amazon between your diamond divine. Thank you. Got a couple of poems I'd like to read uh, tonight. They both come from uh, the collection of poetry I've been working on lately, Farewell to Father. The first one is titled Telephone. A night phone call in exile destroys one's world, a messenger of an inevitable death you can't fool standing at the headboard. Father is dying, says Ola. He's got a month, maybe two. I hear my brother's voice from Canada, and I can and I can see like the world with the paternal tree collapses into nothingness. A night phone call in exile hits one with a bludgeon, takes away one's breath and words. But it's impossible, I say. Bojana was in Szczecin in February. Father was in great shape. He ran like a sprinter, like a sprinter. Father does not get up from mid-March, says the voice in the receiver. He doesn't run anymore. He's on morphine. And the second poem is titled, My Father's Treasures. Father was like a pack rat. He missed nothing, a penny duck in the street. It was money that kept his pocket warm. No nail or the smallest screw on the street could escape father's watchful eye. Even in his old age, he bent down to lift a nut or a gasket one could never get in stores. You know, anything could come in handy, he'd say. My father's treasures were sorted in post-German metal boxes. Polish metal boxes were also hard to get. God forbid, should anything be lost, he'd demand vengeance from heaven and his donor Vetter would be hurt in Bochum. Bochum is a city in Germany where he was born. And that's about a, a thousand kilometers away from my hometown, Szczecin. So just a word of explanation how, <laughs> how loud you could be. <laughs> Thank you very much.